I'm Joyce Oglesby, your host of Beyond This Point Ministries. You've tuned in for part four of Getting Past the Past. We've just gone through the segment of Prisoner to the Past, and we're advancing to a fugitive in the present. Again, if you need to visit the other segments, go to the archives and you'll be able to slide right into today's message. Let's fast forward to 1983. Webby and I will have been married almost 10 years. I have been serving and growing in the Lord for this period of time. Through the grace of God, the prayer I had uttered, Lord, please send me someone to teach me how to love, was being experienced in my life every day. God had handpicked me a man who had put on the cloak of Christ when Webby gave his life to him a few years before we had met. He was completely committed to God and truly adopted the attitude of loving your wife as Christ loves the church. Now, I don't mean to infer that every day was a bed of roses because truly it wasn't but it was pretty near great, even at its worst. I believe in God's magnificent wisdom. He knew when he patched up my husband's heart, he would need to stitch in an extra measure of patience for me, and that's why Webby is so tender for me. I forget the fact that he is with everybody. I'll just not think about that because I like to claim that as my exclusive gift. But the most amazing thing that would impress me in my private life a life I had not yet shared with my husband, and to a great extent still have not. I was very pleased that I allowed my husband to love me. I didn't block his attempts to teach me, nor my desire to return it. I was so hungry for love, there would be no denial of the passage to my heart and the reciprocation of my love to him. It didn't happen just by chance. I would pray day after day, silently to myself, during the times when we were intimate with each other even, I would be praying that God would empower me to be open, to trust, to welcome, to receive the love Webby would share with me. And part two of the prayer was for me to be able to express it and give it back more abundantly to him. And even more than he loved me, which was going to be an awful, awful lot. I would be plowing through God's Word to tenderize my heart and to free up the guilt that was tugging at my very soul, which would creep into my mind and even the tiniest crevices of my heart. It would render me a long-distance slave, if you will, to my family and all that I endured and suffered, but then to know that my mother and younger siblings, especially my sister, would be going through their own hell while I had been released and it made me feel very guilty. I was still invoking sentence upon myself. Those thoughts would rob me of my sleep, my rest, my comfort, my peace, my joy, and my sweetest communion with the Lord. I didn't realize how much I was giving up by allowing the memories to be a part of my inner self. I couldn't explain it to anyone. I was, it was very much personal and private and still secret at that point. After all those years, I was confident I would be less accepted and less loved if anyone knew from whence I came. Dismissing this darkness in my past was actually very healthy and healing, but it wasn't the cure. It was just putting the past in remission, kind of like cancer. I have a young friend. He's single, just turned 27 years old. The day of his 21st birthday, Billy would be diagnosed with leukemia and wasn't supposed to make it. He was in college in Florida, his parents in Indiana. He would inhabit a room at Good Samaritan Hospital in West Palm Beach for a year under the care of an excellent oncologist. I got involved with Billy. His mom is a receptionist at one of the law firms that's a client of mine. I sponsored a team for a golf benefit at the PGA in West Palm where Billy worked. He had aspirations and all the ingredients to become a pro golfer. That life was permanently put on hold. My Move a Mountain prayer ministry began praying for Billy and his family, and with the help of God, Billy defied the odds. In fact, Billy got the green light on his five-year mark last year. That's the big one, you know. If you make it five years, that's really a milestone. A few weeks ago, Billy went in for his six-year blood workup and it came back positive. Suddenly, Billy was staring the nightmare right in the face again. He went through more bone marrow tests 
and had a really difficult time because it got infected and it was a mess. But we beseech the Lord with prayer again on Billy's behalf. Praise God, he's not ready for Billy yet. He has other plans. His bone marrow came back with negative results. That was great news for all of us. And I'd ask you to keep this young man in your prayers. But isn't that how our past is? It's like a cancer. We make that one year, two year, perhaps even make it to the five year milestone when we think it's in full remission and all of a sudden it's meeting us around the bend again. Why? What makes that instant replay button in our heads just decide to go off? It can be so frustrating and really cause you to question your faith. I hate it when that happens. All your thoughts are like these little atoms or something swirling around in your head and they're flowing and buzzing and flying and flitting and it's a wonder they don't collide. Maybe that's why we have nightmares because they do smash and crash. The instant replay button has this magnet in it and it's labeled bad memories and once a bad memory gets close to the proximity, wham, it draws it in like this magnetic field and it comes at such force that it just hits that replay button and you're in for a fitful day or night. I've never gone to a counselor. I have nothing against them. They serve their purpose and many of them do their job very well. I do prefer Christian counselors over the non-Christian, however. But digging up bones has never been my cup of tea. I've always known I wanted no part of that. But sometimes it doesn't take you sitting and pondering those thoughts to bring them up. And I think that same complex mind that traps all those memories and swirls them around has a protective mechanism too. It can block out some bad memories. Remember, I termed mine my vault. Some say blocking bad, bad memories out is healthy. Most counselors would tell you it's not. I'm glad my brain blocked them out. I know it did because I catch glimpses, but I don't want to sit and ponder about it. I don't want to give Satan that kind of time out of my life. Why would I want to recall those vivid facts? I don't need to. I just move on. But I was sitting in a movie once, Schindler's List. Remember that one where the Germans were flushing out the Jews? Well, there's a scene where they burst into a room, seems like a motel room or an apartment, but there was a bed. And I remember them opening fire on the mattress. And suddenly someone fell. They had been hanging onto the slats of the frame. That was a triggering event for a terrible memory of mine. Perhaps I didn't mind, after all, sitting up with my mom till the wee hours of the morning because I always hoped that my perpetrators would fa fall fast asleep and then I could sleep. That was not always the case. So I would hide in the closet, in a corner, under the bed. But there were times that I hung onto the slats of the frame underneath the bed. It worked a few times, but I had long hair. And on a moonlit night, I got grabbed by the head of the hair and yanked out from underneath. Consequently, I remember nothing else in the Schindler's List from that point on. So see, I have enough memories. I don't need more. Why dig them up? It works for some people. For me, it just wasn't the appropriate approach. Don't want to know any more than I have to. Don't want to give Satan that part of my mind. It's mine and he can't have it. I had studied God's word. I knew what I must do. I had to forgive. And I can tell you, I had done that. At least the exercise in my head and my heart was completed. What I had not done was to forgive them face to face. And that was probably not going to happen. And that was that. I was fine with that. I was dealing with it. No one had ever known the ins and outs of what I had endured. It was just between me and God and that's where it would stay. But I knew what his word said. The first book of the apostles deals with this very issue. I knew the scripture and I would be reminded again and again what I needed to do. And again, I'd say, Lord, don't ask me to do that. I can deal with this my way. Don't ask me. I can't, I won't. And so I remained an escapee. 
not in prison, just a fugitive. I would balk at the Lord's will for me in this. Thanking Him and feeling blessed about my release from prison, I just kept holding on to God's instructions for me at bay. Back to 1983. Webby and I were serving at a very large Christian church in the Atlanta area. Actually, that was our first full-time ministry. We had been there since 76, and we served there for almost 18 years. They didn't want us to leave when we did. We've only been in two churches, Atlanta and now Corydon, for 16 years. We've really been truly blessed as a minister's family. But we were lying in bed one night, just yakking about our day. Webby began telling me about a problem with one of the youth he'd encountered, a beautiful young girl, daughter of a prominent member in the church had come into the youth minister's office that day and spilled the beans about her dad molesting her. Webby had been called into the meeting and the two ministers were pretty torn up over the whole ordeal and quite uncertain about the validity of the young girl's story. Webby continued to be terribly distraught as he was relating the story to me. And he said, we just don't know whether to believe her or not, Joyce. You know, this man, we, we know him. He's as good as they come. Now, does he seem, she seem to you to be a likely candidate for molestation? My heart was dying for this young girl and her family. But you know what? It happens to the best of families. But many times, no one believes them. I see this time and time again in my career as a court reporter. Too often young girls never report it because they're afraid no one will believe them. Too often when they do report it, the charges are dropped because they can't convince anyone to believe their story. Consequently, they're sent back into the very home where they're continuously molested. It's terribly disturbing. But there it was, my moment of truth. It had fallen on my shoulders to help this precious girl. I took a deep breath before responding to his question. Does she seem to you to be a likely candidate for molestation? My response to him was simply, do I? There was a silence that ripped through the darkness and chilled to the bone. I felt Webby go limp beside me. He honestly had never suspected anything to that extent. He knew about the physical and verbal abuse, but never suspicioned the sexual. It was a mixed feeling moment. Did I revel in the fact that I was able to disguise the shameful acts for 17 years, or did I recoil for fear it would turn our fairy tale marriage into shambles? The thought had not so much as rolled off my brow as he wrapped me up in his loving, protective arms. He wept over me and with me and told me how sorry he was that I didn't deserve it. It was a moment that God had always known would happen. He knew it at the very time I was being abused years before. God in his all-knowing, all-caring, all-healing power had prepared my husband for such a time as this. Now you see, as did I, why God spared his heart. Funny because all along God kept telling me through his word, assuring me in my prayer life, soothing my heart and calming my fears that it would be okay. I just wouldn't listen to him. It wasn't a voice that I heard in my ear. It was a flood of peace that kept sweeping over me day after day, week after week, year after year. And it was that same sweet peace I had known under the covers with my flashlight and my Gideon's Bible but I kept resisting it. I didn't want to go back to face my enemies because it was like going back to prison. This assurance that God kept sending me and I kept resisting would be the key of hope I would use to get me to obtain the key of faith that would guide me back to the key of peace. I simply hadn't claimed the key as mine I had been resisting it, but now I didn't have to anymore. My secret was no longer hidden. The one person's affection that I didn't want to compromise finally knew the rest of the story. But the process was still unfinished. Join me next week for part five of Getting Past the Past when we'll pick up with 
Fugitive in the Present. Be sure and visit my website for further information on my ministry. May God bless your life, your marriage, and your home. I'm Joyce Oglesby, and I'm in battle for His cause.